take it away, Luna. I think you can. Hey, Tim. How's it going? Hey, Luna. How you doing? Pretty good. Excellent. Welcome, welcome to this episode of The Sun and the Moon. Um, we do not have Alex, Queen of the Sun Grown, here this week. Um, she won't be here next week either. She will be back the following week. Um, so, Tim, how you been, bud? Doing all right. Middle of a move, so uh, that's always fun. But uh, doing pretty well. And yourself? Doing pretty good. Just doing my thing. Growing out here in Oregon. How's the garden doing? It's stoked. It's praying. Praying to the gods. Praying to Figured the as much. <laughs> How about yours? Uh, doing well. I mean, it's a final run pretty much in, in this garden in my uh, what 13-year-old soil. Uh, and uh, I have a Chem D and Dosi, um, two four by eights of each, and they're they're stoked. I'm excited for them. Nice. So, yeah. so this is your last run. Uh, you moving locations? You going somewhere else? Uh, yeah, moving out of Maine, moving back to uh, Massachusetts, uh, Western Mass. Um, getting out of the legal industry, just like a lot of other people. Uh, going back to do like some consulting and helping work with other people in other gardens and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, leave my soil behind. Unfortunately, I have nematodes, so I don't want to bring them with me. You have root knot nematodes. Root knot and two different types of uh, lesion nematodes. I have spiral nematodes and another type of lesion nematodes, and I have a feeling the combination of the three of them are finally starting to uh, cause some issues. So yeah, I think it's one of the things. Um, so <laughs> So Tim, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Um, um, my name is Tim. I've been cultivating cannabis for 20 something years, uh, doing uh, following regenerative uh, living soil practices for, I don't know, 13 or so with this soil. Um, I've been uh, learning about regenerative ag kind of outside of the cannabis space for 15 to 20 years or so. I was real fortunate to work at a hydroponic store um, in New York and Queens uh, hydroponic garden centers. My boss was ahead of the game and he had Acres USA magazine and um, for bread to stones and a whole bunch of like these really great um, agricultural basic books that are really important for people to read. And uh, Eileen Ingram's uh, first books. Uh, so I got a deep dive into this stuff pretty early and uh, it's, it's super fun and interesting to learn about. That's awesome. So um, Tim and I are pretty close friends. Um, we have some really good conversations kind of behind the scenes. We've had some long chats about some pretty um, uh, high conceptual stuff, some some really great soil conversations about the importance of nutrients and nitrogen and, and the diversity of biology, the importance of diversity, what that actually means and look, looks like, um, you know, profiles and fields versus in the forest versus in our, our soil. And so, uh, Tim, I'd like to talk a little bit about that kind of stuff with everyone or um, to everyone. Um, I know you've been doing a bunch of uh, research on nitrogen and like different forms of nitrogen and how they impact plants. Um, I was wondering if you could shed a little bit of light on on that subject and how important different forms of nitrogen are. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, classic uh, nitrogen theory in most of agriculture is uh, plants consume nitrates. They consume some ammonium, but predominantly it's nitrates. Um, that is based off of uh, a lot of failed science. Um, pretty much uh, back in World War I, they realized that the Harbor Bosch process, which creates ammonium, um, which was the basis for the creation of a lot of munitions for World War I. Uh, after World War I was over, they realized they had all this nitrogen sitting around and they weren't just gonna stop that whole industry. So they started selling it to farmers because they realized when they put it on crops, plants grew like crazy. Um, and if you apply nitrate nitrogen to crops, they do grow like crazy, but they're really kind of unhealthy. Um, and when you apply it to um, high organic matter soil, the nitrogen actually burns out the organic matter and releases all the nutrients that are in the soil. So plants really grow like crazy for a while. Um, but then after a handful of years, uh, the whole system starts shutting down. Um, so now we realize that uh, through the work of Dr. White and other scientists who figured out the rhizophagy process and uh, a lot of scientists learning about endophytes, um, they're discovering that um, plants not only farm microbes for their nitrogen and other nutrients, but they uh, have like this crazy symbiotic relationship to capture the nitrogen that's in the air. 78% uh, of all the air we breathe is nitrogen. It's everywhere, it's abundant. There's no reason we should have to pay for it or um, uh, apply it to the soil in a healthy system. 
Um, getting there sometimes can be a little tricky, um, but there are certain forms of nitrogen you can use to help stimulate the soil and help stimulate the proper nitrogen cycle instead of impeding it like using nitrates or ammonium or uh, any of the factory acetylated nitrogen fertilizers. Um, like what? What's that? Like what? Oh, uh, so amino acids. Uh, amino acids are um, the base of everything, really. Uh, they're the base of all life. Uh, every single cell has 40,000 different amino acids floating around in it, and every single second just changing between all these different compounds. All enzymes are, all nitrogenous enzymes have nitrogen in them. All proteins have nitrogen in them. All of our DNA has nitrogen in it. And so really when it gets down to plants, um, if you allow a plant to consume most of its nitrogen through uh, either supplying amino acids uh, through a, a purchased fermented product or a, a ferment that you can make on your own. Um, but ideally plants want to take up their nitrogen through a plant uh, either through, through microbial metabolites or through microbes themselves. Uh, so the rhizophagy cycle, uh, for people who don't know about it, um, essentially plants um, send out um, exudates into the soil that feed certain microbial colonies. Then the microbial colonies grow, then they will eat the, uh, the they'll go in through the root tip where once inside the root tip, they'll be, uh, they'll be exposed to a superoxide which breaks down their outer cells a lot of them will die, they'll get squished. Um, but then the ones that survive, they'll actually, uh, the plant will move them through the roots and send them outside of a root hair. And that's what they found out root hairs are, are actually transportation systems for microbes to create new colonies in the soil. Uh, and depending on um, what type of exudates the plant is exuding at the time, will feed certain microbial colonies <clears throat> and all microbials, all uh, microorganisms have a different, um, uh, nutrient content. They'll have their own NPK value. So they'll feed certain microbes that will say, hey, we need phosphorus. It'll send off a certain signal that will feed certain microbes that are known to solubilize phosphorus and, you know, uptake it. Um, really kind of goes a step beyond uh, the soil food web. Um, the soil food web is based off of microbes eating other microbes and essentially pooping them out. Um, through current science, they realize that's probably only like 10 to 15% of how plants actually uptake their nutrients. Most of it is through the rhizophagy process um, or through other endophytes or other different uh, processes. Um, in, a healthy pro in a healthy system, um, <clears throat> that's how plants will t uptake nitrogen. Also, they're discovering that um, some of Dr. White's students were doing research and discovering that uh, young uh, trichomes on cannabis plants are actually um, are, are theorized to be nitrogen factories. Um, so inside of uh, uh, the trichomes, they're finding um, nitrogen fixing microbes. So nitrogen fixing microbes re rely on the nitrogenous enzyme, uh, the nitrogenase enzyme. The nitrogenase enzyme only uh, can operate in the lack of oxygen and lack of oxygen. Inside of a trichome, uh, cannabinoids are oxygen absorbers. They're free radicals. They're free radical absorbers, so they absorb oxygen. So that creates a perfect environment for the plants to now generate oxygen. The shape of the trichome is a perfect shape that is wonderful for gas exchange. So there's all these different natural processes for plants to uptake nitrogen. Nobody feeds the forest. Like nobody ever feeds, you know, they're one of the most biologically diverse systems that's ever been is prairie culture system, prairie systems, the, 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 the savannas. And they're the most biologically diverse and no one ever fed them any nitrogen, you know, thousands of thousands of pounds of carbon suppressor from the atmosphere. And, you know, no, no nitrogen ever applied because it's, it's hair. It's, you know, the nature has figured out a way to do it. And we've, we've bypassed it. <laughs> yeah. That's so amazing. You just said so much. You, that was huge. That was just like a huge, huge knowledge bomb that you just dropped in. I'm just, I just, agree with a thousand percent on that. Thank you for that. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, um, so uh, to unpack, we, we could talk, but we could break that into little sections and just talk about all of that for, for um, the whole hour. But I want to keep keep going though. That was that was all right. Great. So so that that's like that how nitrogen cycle works. And there's in the environment, there's a whole nitrogen cycle. There's seven or eight processes. Um, it runs through um, nitrogen is fixed out of the air, which has turned into um, nitrate, which then eventually goes into ammonium. Ammonium then turns into uh, amino acids. So um, 
when you feed a plant amino acids, you are feeding a plant the nitrogen, nitrogen in the form that it's also ultimately going to make. If you feed a plant nitrate nitrogen, it uptakes that nitrate nitrogen. It needs a lot more water than any other nutrient uh, nitrogen source available to it. It takes up 10 to 20% more water than it should. Um, then once inside the plant, it uses 10 units of sugar to convert that one unit of nitrogen into an amino acid. So there's all this energy draw from the plant. So, you know, if you look at photosynthesis, photosynthesis creating, you know, ATP and, and glucose, which is creating energy, you're, you're using a lot of photosynthetic energy in order to convert one unit of nitrogen into an amino acid. So if you either allow the natural soil process to happen by not feeding um, soluble nitrogen or tilling or a lot of these processes are disruptive to the microbial system. Um, or if you feed amino acids versus uh, synthetic nitrogen forms, now you're allowing the plant to utilize it, it. You're giving it an energy source instead of an energy drain. Um, in my opinion, this is the key to cannabis quality. Any person that I've suggested you switch over to amino acids versus uh, other forms of nitrogen has noticed a drastic increase in quality. Um, if you just look how nitrate operates inside of a plant, how detrimental it is, it actually creates toxic forms of nitrogen inside a cell and causes cell deaths. And it, the plant quickly heals from it. It's not like apparent to a lot of people, you know, to the outside. But if you if you look at a plant fed nitrate nitrogen, it's big and green and lush, but it's really kind of full of water and kind of really unhealthy. Those are the plants that are very prone to the pests and pathogens. Um, you know, amino acid fed plants are not as tall and lanky. They kind of are, they just they look different. They just have a different feel to them. Um, and it's all that additional plant energy that, you know, the plant isn't using all that sugar just to convert nitrogen into a form it can use. You're providing the form it can use and then it's moving it forward from there. You know, it's all energy. <laughs> what, are, what are your favorite forms of amino acids? Oh, sorry, my cat just jumped behind my computer. What oh, Steve. What? Steve, Steve, Steve. Um, what are your favorite forms of amino acids to use in the garden, Tim? Uh, so uh, soy protein hydrolysate is a, a wonderful one. Um, you could use fish protein hydrolysates as well. They kind of have a different amino acid profile. Um, amino acids are L-amino acids and D-amino acids. L-amino acids are the only ones that are biologically available. Um, depending on your fermentation process, how it's broken down, there's different forms of amino acids that are better than others. Um, I, <clears throat> I try using like high quality ag grade products. Um, um, it's, they're super cheap. They're super efficient. Um, they work really, really well. Uh, my next one is corn steep powder, which is my, one of my favorite things. Yeah. It's just my new, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So you turned me on the corn steep powder, maybe, I don't know, a few months ago. Yeah, yeah, six months ago or something, I fell in the hole. Yeah, yeah, and I've been using it, and I love it, and I love the organic acid profile and all the different organic acids, how they influence, like, the Krebs cycle and different <sighs> metabolic uh, pathways and flavonoid pathways um, and, like, crucial systems in the plant. It's, it's everything. It's, you know, it's amino acids, it's peptides, it's proteins, which are all nitrogen compounds, but all of, like, different energy sources. Um, all the nutrients in it are microbial pro microbial pro microbially processed. Um, it's 30% lactobacillus. It's 30% carb, uh, uh, carbohydrates. I mean, uh, the different plethora of organic acids, uh, citric, acetic, acetic, um, just, it's, it just has a great profile of everything. Um, it's heavily used in the, um, <clears throat> in the, uh, um, pharmaceutical industry and has been used for a really long time to make antibiotics. Uh, any study that I've ever read that corn seed powder has been added to, whether it's aquaponics, uh, growing microbes for enzymes, whether it's uh, feeding to chickens or animals, uh, 20 to 30% increase in growth across the board. Plants, 20 to 30%. Um, and the interesting thing in, that I noticed in one study in plants is it shows a increase in um, um, uh, what was the specific, uh, specific enzyme? And the nitrogenous enzyme, uh, the nitrogenase enzyme, they showed an 15% in increase in that enzyme. That enzyme in the plant is also what allows uh, photosynthesis, 
photosynthesis to happen efficiently. Um, so the more that you have, the more photosynthesis you have, the more energy you have, the more complex compounds you can create, the better your cannabis is or whatever, plants, whatever plants are growing. Um, so this is a byproduct of the corn steep liquor um, industry, right? Well, so it's uh, all of the corn byproducts are, are made through a wet milling industry, a uh, wet, wet mill process. So essentially they just grind all this stuff up, they throw it in a, a, in a water bath, they're grinding it up with the water uh, and they send it through a whole bunch of different sieves and they'll take out, um, um, you know, they'll take out the cornstarch, uh, they'll take out different constituents that they're trying to take out of it. And in the end, you're left with this rich broth that's full of uh, lactobacillus um, and all of the things that they're not straining out, mostly fats, mostly starches, mostly waxes, things that like we are useful in soil systems, but aren't as useful as all the stuff that's kind of left behind enzymes, like just everything from a seed. It's essentially a seed soak. It's a fermented, uh, seed, seed soak, which is just kind of have everything that a plant wants. Have you, have you ever done uh, sprouted seed teas with corn before? Oh yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. You think it's yeah. terrible? No. no. So I actually been having starting to have like a fairly different theory on um, a lot of products, honestly. So corn, corn. Now that we're learning how biologically diverse absolutely everything is, I'm starting to realize and talking to some other um, people who are doing research in the field. Seeds are a great microbial inoculant. You know, every seed has its own uh, biome to it. So we, humans are holobiots, plants are holobiots. Holobiot is an organism that relies on multiple species, multiple organisms living together to survive. So humans, if you removed our microorganisms from our gut, we would cease to exist, we would die. If you take plants, if you take a, a seed and if you completely sterilize it, it will not grow properly it probably won't even germinate. And if it does happen to germinate, it will not germinate well. Um, Dr. White and his team were talking about how they'll get seeds that will send root, tap roots up and their leaves down. They'll lose their uh, 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 gravitropatism, I believe is the word. Um, they'll just do weird things. They're really discovering that the biome seeds contain nine trillion, a healthy seed will contain nine trillion different microbial cells on it. Like that's incredible. <laughs> And they find that 30% of the, the biology that's on a seed is actually vertically transmitted through the plant. So the seeds, the biome that's on the seed will then go into the soil. The soil will then send these uh, complex communication signals with the biome that's around the seed to find out what nutrients are available, what the conditions are, because all these different microbial systems will be influenced on different environmental factors and they'll all communicate together and eventually they'll go, oh, let's germinate and it'll germinate and it will start, you know, those microbes will go into the seed. It will start recruiting other microbial colonies from the surrounding soil. But there's a vast difference between the microbes that are in a plant, microbes that are in the, the rhizos rhizosphere, which is, this, you know, the millimeter right around the outside of the root where the, the, the root hairs are and bulk soil are all drastically different. You know, it, taking um, taking compost and inoculating soil isn't really inoculating soil with the microbes that plants necessarily are using. It will stimulate the entire soil system to allow those microbes to operate more efficiently and together because everyone likes working as a community but you're really not altering, altering the soil community all that much. Um, so I'm looking at seed sprout teas now, especially if they're bought from like a good organic source with someone who understands, or even like producing your own seeds, someone who understands that seeds grown in a biologically diverse system with lots of other roots growing together with that plant that is producing that seed has a richer biome on it than any other seeds. So technically sprouting that seed is a biological inoculant that is exactly perfect for inoculating seeds. 
I like to um, add one one point to that is also consider what's inside the seed, not just what's on outside. <laughs> oh yeah, because um, I, I think it's spermolate when the seed pops, and that's a shot of biology in the soil right where it, it needs to be. That's keyed from the mother plant to that seed. Yeah, well, they're finding a lot of it is also on the outside of the seed. Um, they find that a lot of those uh, those PGPRs are actually. Um, they go into the flower. I have a great article that, that shows the progression of uh, the microbial communities, bacterial and fungal communities from a plant where they just planted it. Um, uh, bulk soil, rhizosphere, stem, leaf, uh, flower, and seed. And they all vary so greatly throughout the time of the plant growing. And half of them we don't even know or can identify. But we realize that like 30% of them, they actually like come from the root. They, they identify them in the, the the stems, they identify them in the flower, and then finally they identify them on the seed just before they harvest the seed. So it's like this crazy, pretty much everything that we really kind of understand or think we kind of know about soil biology and soil food web or a lot of the theories that are being thrown around are actually really kind of being prove, proven wrong now by a lot of uh, biologists and, and microbial research. Can, um, you, can you give me an example? Uh, so, uh, um, so the soil, soil food web theory, um, you know, Elaine Ingram talks about how um, specifically she only thinks that anaerobic microbes, lately she's been swinging over to, to anaerobic and, and flocculative microbes and how important they are. Only anaerobic microbes do this. You need, you know, bacteria, fungi, you know, protozoa, all these things are interchanging. You need more fungi to more bacteria and all this stuff. And, and there's like these set rules and like, Really, we kind of understand that the like, soil, soil system is way more biologically diverse than that. And actually, most of the, the PGPRs, the, the plant growth, uh, uh, plant growth promoting rhizobacters, which are also a lot of the endophytes, and also a lot of the microbes you buy in like powdered products, are, are actually flocculative anaerobes, or, or they don't want an oxygen-rich environment. And if you look, all of the nitrogen fixing microbes because of the nitrogenase enzyme and the fact that oxygen destroys an enzyme, it needs to be in, a, in, an, in an environment with a lack of oxygen. That's why uh, the nitrogen cycle doesn't work in some places. If you till a field and you're introducing oxygen into that field, now you've just destroyed any possibility of nitrogen to be fixed inside that field because there's too much oxygen there. That's why in legumes and other things, they, they have a rhizobia. They have a little nodule that's lack of oxygen, and that's where they produce their nitrogen inside there. But actually, in a healthy system that is not over-oxygenated, um, not over-lined with calcium carbonate, um, and in a reduced environment, actually, um, you know, will foster the environment for those microbes to exist and also foster uh, the proper forms of nitrogen for a plant uptake. So, um, that's like, so, so, oh, sorry, um, no, so a lot of that's going to play into your soil moisture and no-till practices, right? Um, yes. What, what soil moisture do you believe is ideal? Uh, well, so I don't test, so I, and I don't completely under, I understand MBARs, but I don't really know it well enough to actually say anything about it. Um, I, you know, I'm old school. I got pots. I go by weight. Uh, 10 is completely, totally drenched. Zero is totally 100% bone dry. I keep it between like a six and an eight. Uh, I keep it pretty moist all the time. I always want the surface of my soil moist at all times. Like that's where most of the biological activity happens. And if you let that dry out, um, I found that if you put a mulch on and you let a mulch dry out, you'll run into fungus gnat issues. If you use mulch, if you use, you know, top dresses and all that other stuff, and you don't keep the surface of your soil wet, you will run into fungus gnat issues. So if you're trying to run a biological system, because there is something to be said if you are in a bottle nutrient system, if you're in a chemical system where you're not focusing on biology, where you probably want to let the surface of the soil dry out, that probably helps with fungus gnats. But in a microbial rich system where you're focusing on biology, you want to create, you know, kind of a full soil food web. So you want to focus on that mulch. And if you keep that mulch all moist all the time and you bring in some rove beetles or some centipedes or anything else like that, 
uh, hypothalamus miles, any of those other things, if you let the surface soil dry out, they're dying. They're going down to the soil. They're not able to reproduce. You keep the soil moist. Now they're able to reproduce. You might see fungus gnats for a little while, but I've never seen it more than like two or three weeks if you have a healthy system where it just turns over and you never have another issue. You know, it's um, it depends on what type of system you run for sure. But um, keeping that surface of the soil moist is, is vital. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, I'm always talking about moisture, how important moisture is. And, um, you know, once these <clears throat> dry out, they affect our microbial populations and, you know, our microarthropods, our, you know, whole insect friends and all the mm -hmm. portions of all that. Um, but also the availability of nutrients and the ability for the, the root exudates to do their jobs mm -hmm. like in the, the rhizosphere. Um, yeah. which can lead to a lot of different incorrect diagnoses, nutrient deficiency diagnoses, that people will think I'm lacking this nutrient because I'm seeing these symptoms and they start pumping with those nutrients when really their issue was that they didn't have enough um, consistent moisture or a top layer of mulch. Yeah, all, all the time. I mean, <clears throat> you know, in the group, you know, I have that questionnaire that I made and, you know, it's like three quarters of a percent of three quarters of the time the issue comes back to water whether they're not watering properly or they have issues with their water whether it's you know heavy you know it's uh, hard or you know too much sodium or something but water is water is the number one limiting factor in in cr all crops the the top three limiting factors are uh water carbon dioxide and and sunlight like like if you go look at any any farm that's for any agricultural production system, those are the three number one limiting factors. So before you worry about chasing your tail about nutrients or anything else, you always have to make sure you have those on point. Do you have any like tips or tricks if you if your soil does dry out and you are starting to see deficiencies, what's the best way to kick it back into gear and start cycling nutrients without adding more nutrients? Um, uh, I am a huge fan of uh, blending plants, honestly. Um, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you know, you can ferment them, which is awesome. Um, you do the k &F stuff, it's great. But uh, I just love blending plants. Um, you're getting all the endophytes, you're getting all of the, um, everything that's in there is it already being processed by a biological system. So you're just kind of injecting that into the, the soil or if you're fuller spring, or you're, you're injecting that onto a plant and, um, all these amino acids, all these organic acids, um, a lot of these complex sugars, carbohydrates, like they're all, they're food stocks. Like they're, they're what microbes eat. They're the signaling compounds that exist in, in microbial systems that stimulate everything else. Um, so I'm a huge fan of going around and picking off the tips of a bunch of different plants, comfrey, you know, healthy leaves, um, anything. It's out there. <laughs> I grow, I actually grow, uh, uh, comfrey, aloe, and uh, Japanese knotweed indoors because, uh, I mean, they're great for blending. <laughs> blending. Blending stuff. You know, I've never done that before. You're going to have to try that. I mean, comfrey grow is great. You just throw one in a five-gallon pot in your corner of your room, and it just rocks. Like, it's cool. Yeah. Like, it just does its thing. Uh, you, 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 you've seen my contact. I'm constantly blending stuff. People make fun of me for it all the time. Like, you. So... Well, so I asked Dr. Wade about it specifically at the conference. And because you know, I, I, I got the idea from this book, Humosphere, uh, which is really great. It was run, written by this, I can't remember where he's from, in the Scandinavian area of the world. And it got translated to English. And he talks about this uh, chlorophyll water. And he does a bunch of side-by-side -side experiments, which hydroponic and hydroton. And all he did was blend some grass, just grass, and watered one. And the other one, he didn't water. And the results were he was harvesting tomatoes off of hydroponic plants, just blending grass. I guess literally all he was doing it. And uh, so that gave me the idea and I started doing it. And the more I research and the more we know about endophytes and everything else. So I asked Dr. White and he was like, actually, he's like, I feel like there's a major untapped uh, industry in this. He's like taking the endophytic uh, communities from different plants and transforming to other plants to instill certain things. So, it's known that plants uh, and microbes, you know, will trade DNA. Um, uh, lateral DNA transfer, horizontal DNA transfer happens all the time. Um, so, um, 
there's this researcher, uh, Dr. Christine Jones. She's one of my favorites. She has a bunch of things on YouTube. You check them out. Check her out. Um, and uh, she is a huge proponent of the only way you really need to bring in biology is through seeds. Uh, Multi-species cover crops uh, really kind of drive everything. Um, you all problems just seem to go away. You don't need to feed nitrogen anymore if you kind of understand how to run these multi-cropping systems. Um, uh, production in these like systems goes up, huh? This isn't like a field, right? In a, in a field system. And these are all like fields, all most of this research is done in field systems. Like most of the stuff I research is like large scale ag and then I try to bring it into a smaller context. Um, but it's, they're all the same systems essentially. Um, so so that what they show is that if you have uh, four different families of plants, uh, so like a grass, uh, a brassica, a legume, and, uh, you know, like sunflower, I forget what the sunflower family is, um, there is just, you're bringing in different biomes with the seeds, you're bringing different biomes in with the plants. Now, when all these roots start interacting with each other, they start trading information, they start trading DNA, they start trading microbes, and if they're um, certain crops are, are cold tolerant, and it seems the reason why some of them are cold tolerant is because they're their microbial makeup more than anything else. So certain microbes are cold tolerant, and they'll transfer their DNA into the plant, so the plant can be cold, cold tolerant for a little bit longer. Um, they're finding that plants can actually transfer DNA or microbes to other plants that then can also transfer their DNA to other plants to make them cold tolerant as well. So like our really understanding of like us and them and DNA and how things work is really kind of a lot more ambiguous than anybody really thought it was. Um, but inside these systems, they just, they grow a lot of biomass. They grow a lot of health. Plants are just wicked healthy. Uh, they don't need inputs. Uh, the largest yielding crop corn corn yields in the country last year, which like blew the records out of the water, were, were multi-species interplanted crops with no additional end inputs, which according to like common ag is impossible. Like, you know, conventional ag tells us like we need chemicals and GMOs, but these people are showing that you actually just need to plant a bunch of plants together and kind of work with a system and things just grow abundantly. So using like these, using those ideas and, you know, bringing multi-species cover crops indoors or multi-species cover crops outdoors, like you're just building systems. You're just, you're bringing energy into the entire system. You're allowing energy to transfer between plants. Just everything just is more robust and, and happy and healthy. So um, companion plants. The companion plants. plants. And this, they also play a huge role in uh, redox and how redox yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and, and redox also comes down to moist soils. Um, you know, redox, um, for what people don't know, is, uh, is oxidation states of minerals. Um, there's a handful of them. Um, what, iron, manganese, cobalt maybe, I think, is the other one. Um, but those you need to have in the proper oxidation state. They need to have the proper amount of oxygen molecules attached to them. And if they don't, then they become, they're not biologically available. Another huge one is nitrogen. Nitrogen works off of redox states. Um, all these different forms of nitrogen are all different redox states. Um, nitrate is um, NO3, uh, so it's three oxygen molecules. And ammonia is um, um, what NH4, so it's four hydrogen molecules. So there's seven oxidation states away from each other. Um, that matters because if you have an oxidized soil, if you have a soil that you plow, uh, if you have a soil that you let it dry out too much, um, if it's not covered with, with a, some sort of mulch, if it's heated up too much, it always leads to an oxidized state. And you'll always, even if the plants are, even if there is amino acids to be being able to be supplied in the soil, if the soil is oxidized, it's going to take those amino acids and turn them into nitrate no matter what. And they're going to put nitrate into your plant. So that's like another reason to keep your, your plants moist, keep your soil moist. You know, when your soil dries out, it causes a nitrate flush. Like it's just how biology works, it flushes nitrates. Plants don't really like it so much. No, it gets, I, it gets I salty. Like it. <laughs> yeah, it gets salty, you think it's salty. Whew, that was so much. I feel like we just ran a marathon. That was, that was, that was amazing, Tim. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, 
Oh, you want to shift gears and do something else? You want to talk about something Yeah, else? sure. I, I, I just, I just ramble. So he just sent me a no. direction. I'll oh, just ramble. oh no, I, that was amazing. You did nothing <laughs> wrong. That was, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Um, oh, my, my brain is exploding with information. Um, so uh, before we got on the, um, on the podcast, uh, you had mentioned wanting to discuss a little bit about Bukashi. Oh um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> jump on Bukashi a little bit. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, um, uh, Bokashi composting uh, specifically, not necessarily uh, Bokashi as it's seen in the cannabis world of taking the Bokashi grain and putting it on top of your soil, which, um, you know, when building a, a brand new soil that has nothing, you know, nothing really in it besides some compost and some peat moss and stuff, like that might be a good time to inoculate with maybe some Bokashi brand. You know, you'll bring some different diverse microbes into it. But um, putting on top of a soil and watering it in and watching it fuzz, most of those microbes are already in the soil. It's really not doing a tremendous amount. Uh, Lactobacillus species and the streptomyces and all those ones that are in there that are decomposing my microbes, like they're prevalent everywhere. Uh, they're incredibly prevalent. If you put them all, if you put some leaves on top, if you take some cannabis leaves off and you put on top of your soil and you put some mulch on top and you pull it back like two or three days later, I can guarantee you're probably going to see that. That's all the same things. You know, you don't really have to pay for it. Bokashi originally as it was used is uh, anaerobic fermentation. Um, you have a vessel with a drain on the bottom. Um, you put some food scraps in there. You sprinkle a little Bokashi in it and you uh, put a cover on it. So that way you squish out all the oxygen. Uh, the lack of oxygen causes a fermentation instead of uh, an anaerobic de uh, decomposition. Um, anaerobic decomposition um, releases most of the carbon into the atmosphere. Um, if you take a compost, if you make a compost pile, you take, let's say you have a thousand pounds of carbon in that compost pile, you're losing 50 to 60% of it by the time it's into a usable product. And now that usable product, because it's not a lingified, really mature carbon, uh, most of that, if you apply it to a soil, is gone within two years. Uh, it just off gases. Uh, it's not a stable carbon source. So with Bokashi, you, you eliminate the, the loss of carbon. Carbon is a source of all life. It's energy. It's what makes everything work. You know, all sugars, photosynthesis, photosynthesis is just taking carbon, turning it into sugar, which is carbon, and using it. Everything's carbon. Like all energy is carbon. Um, so, yeah. So you don't you don't waste that. So as it as it fills up, it ferments, and everything just turns to mush. Uh, you can put bones in there. You can put meat. You can put fat. You can put all sorts of different things in there. Um, and it just it yeah ferments it all. It breaks it all down. Um, and then you get a leachate out of the bottom, which you can utilize at like a one to one thousand ratio to feed all your plants. Uh, biological okay. stimulant nutrients um from there once you once it's full you let it sit for about a month um and then for me in my house with like four kids it'll take me about three weeks to fill one of these things if i were to take that amount of food scrap and try to feed it to my worms my worms would have food for they wouldn't eat all that food in a year um so your leachate and then you use the remaining to feed to your worms I, re I take all that remaining that like gallon and a half two gallons which is all like squished down and compressed over time like it keeps fermenting down and squishing um and then i can feed it to my worms and my worms chew through it like a month like it's gone like almost instantly so what would usually take producing it, they're consuming it uh yeah well because worms don't actually eat the the they eat the microbes they don't actually eat the food stuff. So this is already microbially broken down. It's fermented. It's totally, it, it, you know, you stick uh, some broccoli in there or something. It just, it just it's just mush. Um, and, or the other thing you can do is you can dig a hole in your garden and you can lay a row in your garden and just cover it up with soil. And within like a month or two, the worms move in and it completely takes over everything. Um, I did that uh, last year. Um, in my garden bed and I just did in a center section where I planted a bunch of garlic and that center section where I planted garlic this year, uh, <laughs> by bulbs that were twice the size of everything else. Uh, that was just from dumping, you know, one, you know, month's worth of food scrap in there really. Um, but, uh, Bokashi composting is, is my favorite way of composting per se. 
Um, you know, you can make static piles. You can, if you're really good at composting, like that's that's wonderful. But as far as like hands off, super easy, um, super useful, uh, very versatile. You know, the the leachate you can use. Um, you know, as a microbial stimulant, it's one to 1,000. You can also use it into your septic system. It's really great for putting down your sink for your septic system. It really stimulates your, your biology and your, your it, they're all like the same microbes. <laughs> Lactobacillus and streptomyces and all these other things, like they control all most, most anaerobic comp compos composition. How does this compare to making like a fermented plant extract, like a lactobacillus based, um, you know, submerged in water and molasses, you know, like with an airlock, that style of fermentation. Well, so that is just, um, so the leachate and that type of product, I assume would be somewhat similar. For, the only difference is, is uh, for like a, um, a FPE, uh, you're using usually like a single stock. I mean, you can use multiple stocks, but I mean, the leachate from a Bokashi will be the leachate of whatever you put in that Bokashi bucket, you know, but the microbes are the same that break it down. Like they're all the same microbes, but whatever you make in the FP, FPE will, you know, it's a breakdown of whatever you put in there. So the difference would be your inputs, essentially. You know, they're both lactobacillus breakdown. They both have probably similar amino acid and enzyme profiles, uh, organic acid profiles. Um, I just found that really great uh, article, fermentation article uh, that I sent you over last night, and they actually break down a lot of the fermentative microbes, and specifically what organic acids they create, and you know what's their influence in food, um, and how they flavor wines, how they flavor cheeses, how they flavor sauerkrauts and pickles, and all these different things. But like, really, they're all the same microbes. They're all the same thing. They're just, uh, you know, it depends on what function you put them on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really like so diverse and so deep and crazy, but really, it's it's so kind simple. of very simple at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. so complex. It's bloody well simple. Yeah, if you just you 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 build it, and they'll come. Keep it moist. Um, you know, keep it covered. Keep a food stock, which all microbes what they want to eat is carbon, and the carbon they ideally want is root exudates. And if you don't have root exudates, you're not building soil, you know, and if you don't cover your soil, you're not really building soil. And if you apply microbial inoculants and you don't have growing roots, you're actually doing a detriment and you're probably burning off more carbon than you're actually benefiting from. You know, my thing, the two most important things you could possibly ever do is a, a dead mulch, number one, and a living mulch as Wait, much as possible. Hold on just a second. So the way you just said about adding a microbial inoculant to soil without roots is a detriment and you burn off carbon. Why is that? Uh, well, because you're introducing a whole bunch of microbes and now they're hungry. What are they going to eat? If they don't have root exudates to eat, they're going to eat whatever's next. And it seems that the next thing that they eat is, is glomulin, the, the really long chain uh, um, humic compound that is produced by... Um, uh, mycorrhizae and other they eat the most complex carbon compounds that we're trying to generate those are the things they eat first so if you aren't providing a way for them to constantly have food um they're they're just not gonna they're just not gonna proliferate and if you provide them simple food sources like sugars or something like that like you're you're really m minimizing the diversity you know the diversity that comes out of root exudates is just it's incredible so, and that's this one species. Now, if you put in four species, six species, you know, like it just starts getting really crazy. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Jones was talking about this one study that they were doing. Um, I forget where it was, but it was like a 13 or 14 year multi-species uh, cover crop study. And they were doing all these different plots and they were doing uh, conventional one species, two species, three species, all the way up to like 10, 15 species. I forget, it was something crazy. And they had a major flood and the entire area was underwater for like three or four weeks. And they thought they thought the, the they thought it was over. They thought everything was dead. They didn't think anything was gonna survive. And she showed pictures of the flood and like some of the taller grasses, some of the the sing the the 
less species taller grasses were above the water and they thought they might survive or whatever. Um, it turns out in the end that the, the study wasn't over and that the, the, the plots with four or more species all did wonderfully and they all survived. Everything else died. And what they theorize is that um, a lot of these microbial interactions that happen uh, create oxygen. You know, there, there's all these different systems. There's all these different things happening. And there, there's possibilities for these systems to generate the things they need to at least sustain for a while. Why, like, serious issues happen. Um, and, and that's a major thing of why, like, regenerative agriculture is going to be the thing that uh, saves the world and allows us to eat. Um, because we're having these major environmental um these these major environmental events we have like these huge droughts or these huge rains we have these huge things that you know we can't predict any longer we don't know really what's going on but we do know that if you build organic matter in your soil you can number one store water in your soil for drought time and also allow water to penetrate into your soil instead of running off into a river and flooding a city down the river and keep it on your land and all you really have to do is not use nitrogen fertilizers, not use a lot of chemicals, and start trying to use like diverse species cover crops. And luckily, a lot of big farmers are realizing this. Um, a lot of the agronomists I listen to, they they really think that like we are we are on the precipice of completely moving away from monoculture. Monoculture just does not work. We are into multi-species cropping systems. Like it's the only way forward. Um, and, and you know, taking that and it just and, and passing it on to like cannabis and, and our ideas and, and how we can build these systems. Like they're all one and the same. All, all, all plants are the same. Um, when I started following a lot of these agronomists, the things that kind of got me hooked onto them is they're talking about terpenes. They're talking about secondary plant metabolites and, and phenols and all these things that, that we're looking for too, <laughs> for, for a slightly different reason. So much research has already been done. We just have to look at many voices and listen to many voices because a lot of it's already been done, like you just said. Oh, yeah. And, that, and that's uh, that's part of the, uh, so Dr. White's team, um, what kind of incited me to ask the question is he was talking about one of the members of his team is working on corn. Um, they're working on bringing uh, endophytic nitrogen fixing microbes back to corn. Uh, if you looked in the history books in corn up until about the 60s, corn actually built soil. Um, it was actually really good for the soil. It had a whole different physiological structure. But once we started doing these breeding techniques and started pumping them full of nitrogen and really hitting them with chemicals, now they're, they operate differently. Um, they're, they deplete the soil. So they're looking at to trying to go into, I think it was Peru, and find these indigenous corn species. And they're finding that these really big, fat, nitrogen fixing microbes and what they do is it's called a uh, Cherokee Cherokee plant medicine and I guess the Cherokee Indians they used to go and they take roots from a bunch of healthy plants and they grind it up and they uh, they had a process I think they heat it up and mixed with some ash or something and they'd inoculate all their seeds with it and that would be the thing that would help stimulate the growth of the seeds um, so they were using that principle like the Cherokee, Cherokee corn medicine ideology to try to inoculate corn and having success um so i mean it's possible we actually had james white on with uh, dr uh av singh and leighton morrison talking exactly about that here a few weeks ago so oh yeah, yeah. dr white's the best oh man oh, yeah. Great. yeah hell of a great guy we'll, oh, we'll yeah. have to try to get him on with you luna because i i think you guys would have a fascinating conversation <laughs> yeah. yeah i'd love to talk to him yeah yeah, yeah he was great Tim, you just put so much information on the table. There's so many different things. Thanks so much. Oh, yeah. Um, Thanks for having me, Luna. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'm not sure where to take the conversation at this point. Well, we do have three questions. And the way that Tim answers, I think three questions would probably finish it off. Okay. Okay. So uh, David wanted to know, um, similar to using corn SST, um, I have a feeling that's probably relation to corn seed powder. Uh, and if so, um, I'd say very similar. Um, corn as SST to me would be all the uh, enzymes and everything else that comes from the first emerging seed. Um, and they might not be the same enzymes, but 
yep. through the microbial breakdown process of creating the corn seed powder, like that, there's a lot of enzymes, there's a lot of similar things going on. Well, but I'd say use both, them. honestly. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I like the next one from, from Diggity Dank. Uh, that's crazy. You just picked up some maize flake stuff from the brew store yesterday to test out. Is it the same thing? No, I would assume maize flakes is probably one of the byproducts, uh, one of the byproducts of corn uh, from the, the milling it product. You know, they, that's probably one of the things that they take off and then the corn seed uh, liquor powder is left over. Um, I'd assume. I, I can't say for sure, but I'm, there's a lot of different corn products out there that this method's used for. Pretty much like anything that has corn in it has gone through the wet milling process. Cool, cool. And uh, he also says, thank you. <laughs> so then uh, David, as the last question, have you heard of finishing off Bokashi bucket in a bag of potting soil for a few weeks to use in your indoor garden? Uh, I would say if you have worms and you have some of the upper soil food web, some macroarthropods, um, some mites, some shredders. Um, I'd say it'd be great. Um, I wouldn't put it in like a fresh bag of soil off the store or even maybe like a fresh mix per se. Um, that might take a little while for it to break down. Uh, but if you have some, if you have some worms in there and you have some other biology to help break it down, um, I'd start light and then go up from there. You know, using it as a as a top dress, as a like underneath your mulch, a little bit underneath your mulch. I I'd say yes for that. Definitely. Now, I have actually one question, and I know that uh, Alexa and Chandler um, from Wormies was talking about using Bakashi instead of brown sugar for FPJs, etc. Have you heard anything on that? Oh yeah, we should get an osmotic extraction. Oh yeah, we should do that real quick. Okay, well, I'll jump off and let you guys talk. <laughs> um, uh, maybe answer Ken's question, and then and then we'll we'll talk about osmotic extraction. Um, so I be honest, I don't practice KNF. I've done a lot of reading. I've done a lot of research about it. Um, I think it's a great system for getting people on to um, more regenerative processes. Um, I can't say whether. So I don't think that it's not the same thing. Um, the reason why people use sugar is for osmotic extraction. And if you were to use um, uh, Bokashi in there, that would probably be more akin to like an FPE where you're using uh, lactobactillus to extract things out of it. Um, do you, do you want to talk about osmotic extraction or do you want me to talk Luna or? You're the guest. Okay. Uh, so osmotic extraction is, um, pretty much using sugar or salt to extract the uh, const the things that are inside of a plant material and it will it'll suck it out. Um, it's heavily used to lower the water activity. Um, so the research that I found specifically for it is from Korea. In Korea, it's heavily used in the fruit industry for plums and for other things to extract the fruit juice out of the plums um, and then they use that and they sell that as a product and then they, that's how the plums are dried. Um, sugar is regularly used as to lower the water activity of uh, various different products for, for getting the moisture out of it. Water activity is the availability of water for microbes and enzymes to operate. Um, so water activity is highly known um, in the food industry specifically because they know if you dip below a certain water activity most microbial communities are shut down and no longer able to operate so with uh, an fpj what you're doing is you're you're creating an osmotic extraction of that plant material the studies i have seen um, sugar is decent at extracting some enzymes some of the other um forget what they're, the organic acids and two other different things they're studying. The, the research paper was for, um, for uh, the food industry. So for beverages, you know, they're just trying to find out how nutritious it was. So um, what it does, it extracts everything out. It also lowers the water activity so no microbes can grow in there. 
Um, if I remember, um, sucrose has a water activity of eight. At a water activity of eight, most microbes are shut down. Uh, the only microbes that really live below that are sucrotolerant uh, and bacillus species. Um, and not many live beyond that. And a lot, even a lot of the bacillus species will shut down at that water activity. And there's only a handful that would survive. So FPJ, as far as I know, there's no real research done on it or anything else. There's been some nutrient analysis done on it. As far as I'm concerned, it's um, a, a low nutrient extraction that contains a lot of sugar and maybe some microbial activity, but probably not a tremendous amount. It may or may not have um, caused some of the uh, endophytic and microbes growing on the phylosphere to cyst and then potentially become available later. But, you know, that's all theory. <laughs> But osmotic extraction is essentially just the, it, it lowers the water activity, so it sucks everything out. So it pulls it out. So it pulls out the, the enzymes, the, some carbohydrates, some amino acids, um, and some organic acids, but it doesn't do as good as a job as other forms of osmotic extraction or other well, forms so, of yeah. They were specifically talking about other more complex sugars, uh, these other like uh, complex fructose sugar compounds um, that don't have as high of a glycemic index. And they actually showed they pulled out almost twice as many enzymes, um, uh, twice as many phenols. Um, there are a whole lot of attributes that were, um, uh, they did a lot better job than sugar. Um, which is neither here or there. It's just an interesting thing. I was trying to figure out what FPJ is, why it works, how it works, to the best of like anybody's uh, uh, ability to understand it because there isn't any research done on it yet. And what about the implications of adding uh, monosaccharide, a simple sugar, um, from you know, like brown sugar into your soil? What, what kind of effects does that have on your, on your soil balance? Well, well, in my opinion, it makes it real one-sided. Um, you know, it is an energy source. Um, adding a little bit of molasses or a little bit of the, a little bit of sugar at certain times, like it, it definitely stimulates plants. Um, it definitely stimulates biology. It definitely causes things to happen. Um, I don't necessarily think it's inherently bad to use it like incredibly low doses. Um, I just have a real hard time using sugar in agriculture at all, really. So um, I that's why I'm, that's why I go to blending plants because in my opinion, blending plants, you're doing everything in FPJ gets put more because you're not selecting anything, you're not not extracting things, you're getting everything that's in that leaf or plant material that you've blended. It's all it's all out there. Some might be broken down by mechanical means, but but really, if you look into the uh, extraction of any, uh, the extraction industry, it's all by mechanical means. They blend it all. They blend it all and they hit it with a solvent and that's how they get things out. So, you know, I don't think it's really doing that much of a detriment to anything. Okay. Yeah, um, and I personally like to blend and strain stuff. I'm constantly doing it and I'm always looking for diversity of complex sugars, uh, polysaccharides um, to help feed you know, wider profiles of biology, um, you know, create a more functional rhizosphere to allow for more nutrients to become more readily available. Um, do you think that maybe having, you know, a, a large amount of simple sugars of, of monosaccharides inhibits that process? Um, I mean, I'm sure it does to a pro extent. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I don't think dumping a lot of simple sugars on on soil is uh, is a good idea really ever. Um, it, it bypasses the entire intention of the soil system. You know, once again, we're talking carbon. You know, we're talking simple foods, simple sugar sources, simple energy sources. I much rather have that system. To me, it's like adding nitrogen. If you add a chemical form of nitrogen, you shut down that natural system. Um, phosphorus, same thing. If you add soluble phosphorus, you shut down the microbial systems that allow phosphorus to become solubilized. So why, um, 
you know, why, why do you want to do that? That's, you know, like you want that system, the process to happen. You know, if that process is happening, you know, it's more efficient than any human form that you could potentially add. So um, I would, I would prefer to, to stimulate the natural system to have the plant exude the sugars and complex carbon compounds that it wants, you know, and um, I don't know that simple sugars is the way to make that happen. Mm -hmm. It sounds, like, it sounds like through this research that like companion planting um, and having like a, a diversity of compounds kind of selected by the plant and produced by the plant is going to be the best way to accomplish this. Well, I, I, everything is diversity. Like that's in, in my 20 plus years of research in this, like that is the answer to everything. It's diversity. It's diversity. You have a diversity of plants. Then you have diversity of complex food sources. Then you have a, a diversity of microbes. And then just everything's happy. It's just how it's supposed to be, you know? When you look at these cropping systems, chemical versus organic versus bio, uh, biodynamic, they all have their attributes and they all are actually incredibly microbial diverse. They all probably have about the same amount of microbes in their system, but the chemical agriculture only has a handful and they're not really protecting anybody. And the organic one has way more and they're starting to actually do some protection. And, and the biodynamic one, actually in studies, I sh they showed that fusarium, the fusarium, uh, detectable fusarium in, um, in their biological assays they did were higher than either the chemical or the organic fields, but showed no damage. When the chemical agricultural field showed not a lot of like detectable as far as their, their analysis went, but showed a large, lar uh, large crop loss. So, you know, it's it's really about diversity. And like, I, I honestly feel like as a humans, we could take a lot from <laughs> like learning about how diversity is everything, you know? 100%. Um, last week we had Matt Powers on. Did you happen to catch it? No, I wanted to listen to it today, but I didn't get a chance to. So we touched a little bit on, on um, the presence of E. coli um, in soil and how like a whole bunch of, of soil biology, like over 90% of soil biology has been um, shown to be, you know, DNA sequence, and it's been shown to be um, E. coli. Um, do you know much about E. coli and and how much of these different nutrient solubilizing, you know, how much nutrient solubilizing potential E. coli has, and is this the biology that we want to create a diversity of? Um, I'd say that's that probably, that's probably we... an impossible question to answer. Well, no, I, I just say that we really don't know, honestly. Like we, we keep finding out that we're wrong. Um, you know, uh, the, Dr. Christine Jones, like what she was like, oh, I want, I want to write a book about all this, but you know, every time I want to write a book, then I realize I'm wrong. You know, and she's like, don't listen to stuff that I, I said five years ago because you know some of it's accurate, but like this, the the, the research and and it's it's moving so rapidly, and you know, like the. The, uh, honestly, like a lot of the original organic ideology of how people grew crops organically is kind of really wrong. Um, and we're really learning so much more. And it all comes back to diversity. And if E. coli is one of the playing members inside of there that is important, then if you provide the proper habitat for plants to grow uh for everything to, to thrive, then it's going to do what it's going to do. You know, I don't think we really have to say that we want this, we want that, we want, because like, we really don't know, you know, uh, so yeah, like, so the, like the, the bacillus, the bacillus family of, of, of uh, bacteria, um, they, they thought they knew what was going on with them. And they were like, oh, wow, we see them. And there's some that are positive and some that are, you know, gram positive, some are gram negative. Some of them are, you know, they all look pretty much the same. Like, oh, they're all cool. And now we get DNA sequencing. And we're like, holy shit. Actually, they're incredibly diverse. We're setting these over here, these over there. They all look the same, but they're actually all going all these different places because they all have these different functions. We're realizing that Bacillus ductilis, Bacillus thuringiensis, Bacillus anthraxis, Bacillus, um, there's another one with a long name, um, uh, they all carry the same genetic makeup to potentially be pathogenic, pathogenic. You know, they all carry the possibility to produce the same toxins that anthrax produces. And anthrax isn't, is one of the most 
common soil microbes, but we really don't know what it does all the time. You know, it you can isolate it and you can create this harmful poison out of it, but it's it's literally fucking everywhere. You know, and I just I don't think we can really say. I think that we do our best to foster the environment, it's like planting diverse cover crops, you know, trying to read our environment, trying to understand like what we can do to foster a my more microbial rich system is is the best thing we can do you know uh, that's that's it like however we go about doing that and there's a lot of research out there um but it, it all comes back to roots <laughs> it all goes back to roots yeah there has been countless times where i've learned something new and found out that something that i said and something that i talked about was completely wrong and happens yeah. almost, on a daily, almost on a daily basis um especially bringing on new guests and talking about new things um i find that there's there's things that I've done or do um, that I thought were working for a certain reason. And it turns out that they're not working for that reason at all. Um, and then I'll think that they don't work at all. And then I'll come to learn that they work, but for a completely different reason. Um, and so it's sometimes it's not even necessarily these things don't have merit or value, but that our understanding of why they're functioning and how they work is constantly evolving um, mm -hmm. as we do research into um, um, a, a field. <laughs> a field of research um, that hasn't been studied so thoroughly um, up until just recently. Um, this mm -hmm. kind of this kind of information wasn't economically viable and kind of went against the grain of like the chemical agriculture interest industry and the military industrial complex, um, yeah. which made it which made it, you know, a threat to them. So it was not pursued. Yeah, so, it's it, it's interesting if you go look up organic nitrogen, if you go look up how plants take up full molecules, uh, uh, endocytosis, where plants will, and, and the rise of phagy cycle. But but still, if you go to any ag college, even organic ag college, they will still tell you that nit nitrate nitrogen is how plants grow. So, and plants don't uptake microbes, and plants don't do this, and plants can't take up complex molecules, only ions. And it's all, there's, there's, tons of research to prove that completely wrong that there's different and uh, there's different they actually know the genes for the nitrate transport system and the amino acid transport systems and how they upregulate and downregulate depending on the nitrogen forms that it's consuming at the time like the research is there i was listening to the beginning of uh, one of john kemp's talks and and they had a, a lady on and she was talking about how um there is actually like a lot of this research out there there's like billions and billions of dollars of, of some of this research out there and you know these these companies uh you know either companies do the research or colleges but it just it goes and sits on the shelf and if nobody's digging for it it just dies there and the one of the reasons why i love following john kemp and some of these other agronomists who just like they just go sit in literature they just go sit in research papers and they go find these obscure things like redox in agriculture wasn't really a thing until a handful of years ago when John Kemp was reading through some literature and he realized was trying to understand why certain tests were showing why iron was showing up and certain tests weren't and found uh, Dr. Olivier who was like world renowned and, and, and then started working together and started like really sussing these things out how it works inside plants. And you know, there's uh, that's a problem with science sometimes. Science is segmented. Like there's all these things, all these different places, and there's not a lot of people to kind of round it all together and 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 pull things out of it. We all have know? to cooperate, you know. We, we all have, have to cooperate and be able to take in new information. Well, um, that, that comes back at diversity, <laughs> cooperation, <laughs> and you yeah. know, and I feel like it's really important to not be rigid in like a belief system. Um, surrounding science, you know, science is constantly changing and you need to change with science if you want to adapt and grow and improve. Um, yeah, I feel dogma, dogmas have no place in agriculture. Um, I've definitely watched it, uh, the, the classic like Rodell biodynamic debate for 80 years when that was a big thing. And there's all these different permaculture versus organic and this versus that. And it's like, really like they all have lots of things to offer. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really about, what's that? Sorry. It's, it's really about what I'll say in a second. But yeah, no, it's, it's really about like taking the things that work best for your environment and your system and utilizing them, whatever that may be. And, you know, but it's like, you got to know what's around you a little bit and not just blindly use a system because somebody tells you that you need to do something. Right. Um, yeah, the infighting in the, in the organic community can be, can be so intense. 
Um, <laughs> I, think, I think we all need to respect each other. We all need to, you know, take a look at what we're doing and see where the value is and how it can be implemented correctly um, and where the strengths and weaknesses are and come together and, and grow and adapt and create better systems collectively. Um, I agree completely. We should, all, we should all work together. I agree. We need to be we need to be fighting those those chemicalized people, not each other. That's it. Well, and it's also but but even but even getting into that too is like uh, sometimes um, uh, even dogmatic and organic versus chemical because there there's a lot of people out there who are, are are trying their best and they still use chemicals sometimes, but but they're really trying to transition. And you know, a, a lot of agronomists kind of get like a, a or, or farmers kind of get like a bad rep for you know people use chemicals. But listening to a lot of them, a lot of them just don't know any other way. And having like a, a nice communication with somebody who's not like, oh, use chemicals, you know, is like I'm really not kind of, on a person. I don't think we should oh, be no. shitting people. Oh no, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. But it's it's definitely um um. Yeah, acceptance all around. It's it's a it's really a, a great change. I, I hope that um, um, it's exciting to see so much change happen so rapidly. Unfortunately, it's because it's an absolute necessity at this point. But hopefully, we still have time. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes that necessity is, is gonna it's gonna breed innovation. It's gonna create new new things. Yeah, if we're stubborn. We like to not do stuff until we really have to, right? That's, that, that's true. And now we have this big, this big <laughs> dooms doomsday almost kind of coming towards us. Um, yeah. With a timer on it, and everyone's like, "Quick, we need to fix the the, the agriculture system." You know, I, I I just hope that people latch on to the fact that regenerative agriculture is actually the way to fix all this, and not technological advancements of whatever people want to do like really the answer is just put the carbon back in the soil like it's really really simple you put carbon back in the soil you put water back in the soil everything goes back the way it should be <laughs> like we don't need to like seed clouds or you know put chemicals in the air or anything else we just need to like put carbon back in the soil that's it we could have ai operated fertigation systems how about that does that solve it? hey as long as they're focused on making sure that carbon gets good deep in the soil like i'm all about it <laughs> I'm just talking shit. Just talking oh, shit. let's teach AI to build carbon. Then we're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I actually like using AI um, to, to kind of connect some dots. I like to have conversations about regenerative agriculture with AI. It's pretty interesting. And I've talked to you about that a little bit, and you're 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 a little iffy on the subject, but I mean, I like stuff. I so like I, I kind of wish I knew how to under understand how to utilize it better because I definitely know I spend too much time trying to find what I even want to try to get the answer I'm looking for. Where if I know I could be like, hey, AI, find me all the articles I have to do with this or whatever. And then I can suss through them. I just have a hard time with AI coming to a conclusion about anything. Because even in these research papers, I get way more out of the research paper in like a couple lines just like pegged in it, which will be from a different research paper. You know, like sometimes there's like all these little gems pegged in things. And then you, you go down this rabbit hole and you find another research paper that kind of like ties all these different things together. And, and AI, unfortunately, I don't know if it has that capability yet. Sorry. I'll have to show you some stuff. We'll do it. We'll do I, I'm, I'm open, you know, I just, you know. It's doomsday and all, you know. <laughs> I mean, thank you, AI. I, thank you, AI. Thank you, AI. Don't worry. They're going to consume all this information. They're going to know you're talking shit. They're going to come after you. No, I already, well, I already told out AI to, uh, yeah. What? Uh, all right, so, so we're, we're, how are you feeling? You want to keep going? I mean, whatever. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's your show. Yeah, keep going. Ken says keep going. So that means we have to keep going. All right. So usually, what next? Usually we try to keep it to between 60 and 90 minutes. Um, so we have another like 50 minutes. And we'll put that. All right. So uh, you want to talk about another little rabbit hole that I've kind of been on that I haven't really discussed at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah glycerin. I'm sorry, what? Vegetable glycerin. Oh, okay. Glycerin. Vegetable glycerin. Glycerol. Uh, glycerol is the natural byproduct of making soap. Um, it's also a byproduct of the biodiesel bio industry. It's uh, the byproduct of uh, esterification and siphonication 
of fatty acids. Um, it is a, um, it's an interesting molecule. It's not a, it's not a sugar. It's a sugar alcohol, meaning it has the sweetness of a sugar and some of the attributes of a sugar, but it is also has some of the attributes of an alcohol. So it's a polar and non-polar solvent. Um, I've been using it for making glycerite tinctures for years for cannabis. It's my favorite form of uh, cannabis medicine. But looking into research for science, it's actually uh, really great for growing microbes. Uh, there is a glycerol pathway in all plants and microbial systems. Um, it's used as an energy source. Um, they, it's a great sticker spreader. I've been putting a little bit in foliar sprays. Uh, it just allows the water to stay on the leaf surface better and for a longer period of time. So that way it allows better absorption into the plant. Interesting. Um, uh, so what, what, what are you using? You just, just vegetable glycerin. Vegetable glycerin? Like, but yeah. like in what so, from the like kind of product? What is it? What, what are no, you it's vegetable glycerin. It's just, uh, I mean, so it's if you buy it in small quantities, it's not so cheap. If you buy it in a gallon plus, it's not incredibly expensive. Um, I don't use a lot of it. Um, most of the, so like corn seed powder, corn seed powder is the reason why I came into agriculture is because it's a byproduct of an industry and they were actually paying a lot of money and destroying um, uh, and, and, and hurting the ecosystem by putting it through the wastewater system. So they're trying to figure out a different way to, to do something with it. So they started doing research in agriculture and they found out how great it is in agriculture. So now they have another stream. Glycerin is the same thing. Glycerol, um, ever since biodiesel became a thing, now they have so much glycerin on the market and they are burning it, which isn't real efficient. They're throwing it out, which isn't great. Um, you know, large quantities in this environment in a, in, 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 in a contained environment isn't so great, but you know, a little bit, in an agricultural system is actually very beneficial. So a lot of the research they were doing was with a crude glycerin, uh, which um, is, I guess, like 80% glycerin. And then it has some other uh, leftover byproducts of, of the, the processing of the siphonication. Um, so just some minerals and stuff, really. Um, I've been using the refined stuff uh, that is, uh, you know, food grade, just because I had some around. I've been playing around with it. Um, it's a it it wets soil really well. Uh, it's a wetting agent. You know, it 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 has a weird interaction with water. It makes it it's it's hydrophobic. It's hydro. It absorbs water. So when you add it to water, it gives water this interesting quality. And I found that if any soil is you're asking about soils that are dried out, a little bit of glycerin, like a tablespoon per glycerin, a tablespoon of glycerin per gallon, um, makes the water wetter and pots just get wet right away. Um, I didn't water one day and the surface of my mulch dried out a little more than I like it to. And I threw some glycerin in there and it just moistened it up so nicely. Um, it's used for did the you, growth of microbes. Wait, so did you come up with this? Uh, not entirely. I mean, I've read research. But once again, they're trying to find out alternative uses for glycerin because there's so much around. So they're looking to agriculture. Uh, because, you know, everybody's looking for uh, biostimulants and all these other things. Uh, it's heavily used in the, um, it's actually used in the bottled microbial industry and, you know, powdered microbial industry is a growth, uh, a growth medium for microbes. So I guess I added like 20% in agars and certain um, growth chambers for these microbes. It, it, it aids in microbial growth. Um, uh, it's interesting. I'm like still just playing around with it. I'm just studying it. Um, but I've, I've only foliar sprayed it on this one crop. And uh, I mean, I haven't done a side by side, but for foliar sprays, I definitely notice a more beneficial result from them. Very uh, interesting. You could get yeah. some of the research you're looking for on that through the uh, guys that are doing the agar and the mushrooms. There's probably a lot of research on that side of it uh, over there. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's it. I was looking into the uh, um, um, biofermentation industries and um, yeah, it's it's it's, it's it, glycerin natural exists in plants like it, it's it natural exists in plants it has a pathway. It, it's an energy storage device um, that plants use inside of it. Um, 
it's just interesting. It's another one of those things. It's um, it's like a cool party trick to add for certain things. Um, foliar sprays and keeping soil moist. Um, seems to work wonder if, it, if, if some of the molecules in it are. Uh, um, oh, geez, no, I lost it. Uh, in the soil, the glomulin. Well, glomulin is um, a very long chain, un, as far as I know, undescribable carbon compound. Glomulin, I think, is actually a name for, uh, like, nobody really can put their finger on what humic acid is, and I don't think anybody can really put their finger on what glomulin is. It's just like really this crazy complex molecule. Um, uh, but here, let me find, I just have like, Right, let me pull up my glycerin tab real quick. <laughs> um, 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 yeah, it's, so it's 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 it's, it's really interesting. I, I I stumbled across it when I was looking up soap making um, because soap making is uh, super interesting interesting as well as far as um, making soaps for potential you know potassium salts and fatty acids for for IPM regimens and stuff. Um, and, and glycerin is one of the, the main, uh, oh, that's the other thing. I found a couple studies that says the application of glycerol, which is glycerin, induced powdery motor resistance in clover. And it showed that there was a 20, per, that it, it um, they were doing uh, DNA analysis and testing um, certain um, genomic, um, uh, what is it called? Um, certain genetic markers and they found that certain genetic markers were stimulated when in the presence of glycerol specifically the ones that inhibited powdery motor so yeah so that's this where i like started that that and i'm trying to I, like there's different genetic pathways for each different um potential powdery mildew because there's so many different powdery mildews and you know there's, there's, a, there's a lot of like mixed signs to it you know to, to equate one to the other isn't exact but um i don't know so i'm that's studying fantastic. that's really cool i just got schooled yeah I'm, glycerin. Definitely, I'm gonna pick up some vegetable glycerin and give this a try yeah glycerin especially for foliar sprays um and uh definitely I, I did a large application in in my reservoir like you know probably an ounce a gallon or something and the consistency of the water changed like it became uh thicker I mean, interesting but it, it definitely made the soil um more evenly moist you know it it it, it penetrated the soil really nicely so my yeah. first thought is using it in like a higher dosage around like the edges of the pots because i always deal with like the edges right like on my on oh my yeah right oh, yeah. like a kind of soil thing like adding adding the like a higher concentration around the edges and seeing how that affects the the water retention of those portions of the plant. Yeah, that's why I definitely, um, I, I, I did a light application when I, when I, uh, the surface of my soil dried out. I just did like a real light application right on the surface, not to even penetrate that much. And it just really moistened everything up really, really nicely. I was pretty amazed of how, how good of a job it did. That's really cool. Yeah. That's amazing. And, wow. Oh, glycerin, good old glycerin. I've loved glycerin for years. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Are you looking something up? Do you have something else you wanted to? I, I was I was seeing uh, I had my uh, my glycerin thing up here, and I was trying to see. I had a couple of things, but my tabs get all crazy. Um, yeah. Oh, here's another one. Application of glycerol as a foliar spray. Defense response uh, activate defense response and enhances disease resistance in cocoa. In in co in what? In cocoa. Oh, okay. Cool. In cacao. Uh, so yeah. They, you, have you ever heard of the the um, growth defense trade off? No. So it's so plants have like a particular amount of energy to allocate to specific processes, and sometimes adding compounds or too much of particular compounds that stimulate physiological responses can reallocate the amount of energy that a plant has to that process instead of to other processes that it might. Um, that might be better for us. That might be better for our goals, like yields. So I don't disagree with that at all. I bet that is very real. Uh, yeah. So actually, I was just looking at this research. Yeah. There's a um, 
inside of the placid, there is the G3P pathway, which uh, glycerol directly feeds. Um, the GP3 pathway is um, a defense response pathway. It feeds its defense, defense response pathway. So with certain things, I question whether like, if adding glycerin that is um, already a, a molecule that's already inside the plant is putting more of that in there, stimulating something it shouldn't, or is it maybe potentially giving energy to the whole system? You know, and then there's also something we said, um, you know, listen, to a lot of these agronomists uh, listening to um, this guy, Rick Haney, who developed the Haney soil test, who, who like I learned a lot of this stuff about nitrogen from and a lot of these people who study nitrogen um, and the effects of nitrate, nitrate, nitrogen on plants. Uh, and they say we need to take out all research on plants that we have, like every understanding that we've done all the research that we've done that's based on nitrogen inputs uh nitrate inputs and, and throw it out because it's all wrong uh plants just physical physiologically operate differently when they're not fed nitrogen nit nitrate nitrogen um they and also when they're not fed chemicals and also if they're not in a diverse polyculture cropping system they're not operating their full genetic potential either so you know maybe like that research could have come from a system that was already deficient in energy. And then by adding that additional thing, they've maybe taken the minimal amount of energy that's there and then transferred it to there. But maybe in a system that has a plethora of energy from the proper forms of nitrogen or growing in a diverse system, maybe stimulating some of these pathways might not be a full detriment to the plant. You know, it's like, who knows? You know, yeah, for there's, sure. there's only so much energy a plant can create, and that's all based off photosynthesis. And according to like a lot of people study it, say like most plants are only operating at like 20 to 30 percent of the photosynthetic uh, capacity that they potentially could. And that's in like most chemically run systems. And if you even bump it up 10 or 20 percent, like crazy things happen, like crazy things start happening. And, you know, that's oh, what's that? Oh, uh, sorry. So that just kind of reminds me of what you were talking about earlier about how different forms of nitrogen, one will take energy from the plant to make it available and another um, gives energy to the plant. So, yep. so there can be different compounds that may may trigger physiological responses that pull energy and reallocate it. And there may be different compounds that add energy to them, but we're almost not completely certain which ones are which at this point. There's a lot more research to be done. Oh yeah. So, I mean, so the way I look at it is the reason why I like feeding amino acids and, and the way I've like uh, came about this before anything else is um, if you look at all phenol pathways, if you look at all flavonol, flavonoid pathways, and if you look at all terpene pathways, they all start with amino acids. Um, if you, um, um, so THC, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol is three isoprene rings, three, uh, three terpene rings combined together to create a uh, cannabinoid. Um, each one of those isoprene rings takes, uh, three units of ATP in order to create one of them. So it takes nine units of ATP in order to create, uh, a, a single cannabinoid molecule. Um, every rotation of the photosynthetic cycle creates two units of ATP. So you need uh, four and a half runs of the photosynthetic cycle in order to create a cannabinoid. So let's say also those nine units of ATP what, or 10 units of ATP could also potentially be needed to transfer nitrogen to the proper form of the amino acid that's needed if you're feeding the wrong form of nitrogen. So it's like, where do you want that energy to go? I'd much rather energy go right here then to go here, then potentially go here and all the way up here. And now all of a sudden, like you wasted all this energy just to, so to convert that nitrogen to do something, you know? So is, is the, the, the reasoning behind why we don't want a bunch of nitrogen latent flower because it pulls energy away from, from bud development is would adding this form of nitrogen be okay? Like in flower? Yes. Um, so uh, nitrate nitrogen is a vegetative growth molecule. Like if you feed nitrate nitrogen, the plant just wants to grow and it just wants to veg. 
it's actually known in agriculture that you can uh, foliar apply or stimulate different forms of nitrogen in the system to, to stimulate flowering or vegetative growth. Uh, uh, ammonia is a, a flowering, it triggers flowering for whatever reason. So amino acids doesn't really trigger anything. It's just like an energy source and it doesn't stimulate one way or the other. It just, it's, it just stimulates. Not only, so if you feed it to the soil, most likely all those amino acids are gonna be used as signaling molecules to feed a lot of the microbial communities and lab on microbes will probably cycle it through themselves. And then eventually in the end, it will come out as nitrogen for the plant. Like the nitrogen, nit some of it will go directly to the plant, but it's, you're not only feeding the plant, you're also stimulating the entire soil environment as well. Um, so, you know, and when you feed nitrate nitrogen, you're shutting down the whole soil system and you're using all this energy. And so I don't feel like you ever want to see your plants get yellow. I don't ever want to see leaves falling off the bottom of our plants. Um, I like to see a plant, like if it's going to sign us from the top and change colors, or sometimes the whole plant might yellow out, but I never want to see death from the bottom. Death from the bottom to me is you're missing. You're missing either potassium, you're missing magnesium, you're missing nitrogen. And a lot of times with um, the ideology of stopping nitrogen like two, two weeks in a flower or so, you're depriving the plant of nitrogen. If you look at nitrogen, nitrogen is the base of all the compounds that create all those secondary plant metabolites that we're after. So if you're robbing the plant of nitrogen, it's using that nitrogen just to grow and survive and to do what it needs to do. And it's not creating those complex compounds. So green plants. No, my plants are green all the way to the end. Totally green. All the way to the end. What, all the way to the end. Does that affect the smoothness of your smoke? No, I love smoking cannabis for 13 days as soon as it's dry. It's the best. <laughs> um, and that, that comes down to another theory of like, I think that if you feed these forms of nitrogen, you can smoke cannabis as soon as it's dry and curing goes out the window. So if you look into tobacco, Why tobacco, huh? Why? Uh, so if you look in tobacco, so Sorry. tobacco, it's known that um, if you... So tobacco is all farmed off of nitrogen, you know, nitrate nitrogen. They don't use biological systems, but they know that if a plant is too green, it's overfed nitrogen and it will have a harsh smoke. But they also know the reason why is because it will start off gassing more ammonia. So it's the whole process. So like it's, it, it, turn, it goes back into the nitrogen cycle. You have all these, the plant uptakes the wrong form of nitrogen the nitrogen sits in the plant and it just sits there. And I've actually seen studies that shows that there's hydrazine and some of these other complex nitrogen compounds. Hydrogen is rocket fuel, it's jet fuel. It's what they use to send rockets into space. And they've discovered it in cannabis. And I feel like part of it has to do with an incomplete nitrogen cycle and where the nitrogen is being stored inside the plant instead of being allowed to be used in the protein process or allowed to be brought into amino acids, the plant just stores it because it doesn't know what to do with this uh, this nitrogen compound that is now taken up. It's forced to because it's forced up with water um, and it just sits there. And now it has to off gas. And as you chop down the plant, the plant has to off gas and it needs to release that into the atmosphere over a period of time through enzymatic action. And they know about this in tobacco. So we can, like, I try to correlate that to cannabis and like some cannabis, yeah, you have to cure. Like, you know, if like they just chopped it down, like, oh man, that's too harsh. It's snap, crackle and popping. But with cannabis that's fed uh, through a biological system or only amino acids, man, it's the best at 14 days. As soon as it comes off the line, like that's, there's nothing better. You know, I feel like it just starts going downhill after that, honestly. Um, but- so uh, the ammonia production is affected by using um, amino acids as your nitrogen. Cycle. Well, so so through through the nitrogen cycle, the way nitrogen wants to go, uh, nit uh, nitrate, nitrogen, and then if it's inside the plant, as the plant's drying, there's still nitrogenous enzymes, nitrogenase enzymes, and other types of biological processes going on that will free that nitrogen, and they'll change the oxidation state of it into ammonia, and then ammonia will off-gas. And that's, 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 that's how the nitrogen cycle works. A lot of it off gases, you know, putrefaction, 
Um, you lose a lot in compost piles, you know, just ammonia, ammonia, ammonia generating microbes will take the nitrogen that's there and convert it. As the proteins break down, you know, all these amino acids start breaking down, the nitrogen has to go somewhere, turns in ammonia, and then it gets off gassed. Um, so like there's, there's always this process going on. Um, and yeah, uh, making sure that plants are not starved at nitrogen, uh, the proper forms of nitrogen are, are, are vital to building complex compounds. You don't want your plant to starve ever. <clears throat> A starving plant is not is going to be complex as complex. It just can't. How, how does this play into thiol production? We haven't talked about thiols at all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, so thiols are one part of it, but then you have alcohols and ketones and, and esters and like, there's so many different compounds that are actually create the subtle effects of cannabis. Like thiols are definitely one of them, but the thiols are also, um, uh, they're vital antioxidant systems inside the plant. Like they exist all the time. Like they're constantly cycling. Uh, thiols specifically are just um, uh, sulfur cont containing amino acids. That's essentially all they are. Some of them are more complex, but they all have a base of a sulfur. Um, what is it? Um, um, oh God, I can't remember the name of the two, name of the two amino acids. Cysteine and... Um, a me me methyl methylene, methylene, methylene. I'm, I'm bad at pronouncing things, but the, those are the two sulfur based com uh, nitrogenous compounds. And those two uh, deal with the whole oxidation system inside the plant. And then also they will build uh, some of your more complex aroma compounds as well. Um, but it seems that like the thiol that is in skunk seems to be the most present present thiol in all of cannabis. And that seems to be the base of it. And everything else modulates, you know, S smells and aromas get heavy. So <laughs> thiol and skunk. So the, the, the skunk aroma that you get like from the skunk is yeah. the, where you get the, the skunk smell that um, in cannabis, which is a sulfur compound. Yeah, it's metacaprin. Yeah, metacaprin. Metacaprin are also known as a thiol. No acids. So, so, um, you know, I'm familiar with your your soil mix, and you use a lot of sulfates, and you use a lot of amino acids. Do you feel oh, yeah. like the combination of sulfates and amino acids are going to boost your thiol and those other volatile compounds um, to create aroma and therapeutic effects? Uh, I find that um, cannabis is a sulfur hog. I mean, I think cannabis needs uh, a lot of sulfur. <laughs> uh, I, I've, I've only found good things from that. I use a shitload of gypsum. Uh, calcium and sulfur kind of drive most of the system. Um, yeah, so using, using amino acids, uh, making sure you have adequate sulfur inside your soil, um, and then ultimately, you know, having a robust biological system is, is kind of the the best way for those complex compounds to be created. So I don't really like to necessarily look at it as like, um, this will make this happen because like there's, there's so much in between, but to make sure that like there's adequate levels of everything, you know? Yeah. So uh, adequate levels of sulfur, adequate levels of boron, adequate levels of silica and calcium um, are like kind of, like the, the one of some of the most important things I feel are in cannabis, you know, the, those are the things that that help drive the most quality and your forms of nitrogen, of course. Incredible. Uh, yeah. So yeah, here it is. Uh, what is it? Um, uh, e to betel one thiol. Yeah. That's, that's the most common one in skunk, but it's also the most common one in cannabis. And then you get into theoacetates and then alkaloids, like aroma, aromas and smells like it's crazy heavy. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that gets deep. <laughs> um, there is a research paper that I just found uh, from a couple years ago. It was actually produced by a police department, um, drug sniffing dogs. Uh, They're trying to suss out uh, more novel compounds to train drug sniffing dogs on. Um, cause they knew about, I forget what the number was 300 or something like that. They knew about 300 compounds in cannabis. 
uh, and they just did a whole nother study and they pulled out thousands. It was crazy. And that's where they did the full breakdown of different thiols and aroma compounds and esters. And it's um, all these things work interchangeably to create the experience. And um, they're just all these robust secondary plant metabolites that in order for them to be created, it creates a lot of, it takes a lot of plant energy and plant energy is photosynthesis. And the best way to increase photosynthesis is a robust microbial system and feeding the proper forms of them, in my opinion. And lots of roots in the soil. Oh yeah, of course, soil, definitely. The soil, for sure. Well, that's a, that's a robust microbial system. 100%. Whew, Tim, this was incredible. One of the best podcasts I think I've ever heard. This oh. is just fantastic. You did Thanks. a great job, man. That was, that was incredible. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, oh, Ken, yeah. do, we have, do we have any more questions? Actually, we do have two more questions that came in uh, from Marty. Uh, I'm foliar spraying Cal Carb, I guess, calcium carbonate. Does anyone know if that can potentially affect the stomata when, the, uh, when it leaves this white powder behind? Um, what product is it? Is it a micronized calcium carbonate? Um, is it amino acid chelated carbonate? Um, cause I know that there is really great studies with like finely micronized calcium carbonate, like very micronized, uh, water soluble, um, combined with amino acids causes almost direct calcium uptake and also creates, uh, an additional, uh, area of carbon dioxide around the the, the leaf as the carbonate breaks free. Um, so like that's, that's really dependent. Um, I, I wouldn't use like lime or powdered lime or anything else like that and foliar spray with it. Cause that's not, even though it seems super fine, it's not micronized. It's not fine enough. Um, so oh. he's saying it's, uh, um, extreme uh, gardening. Yeah. Gardening. yeah. So, I mean, I, if it's maybe lower application rate, uh, I probably really wouldn't worry about it too much. It seems like maybe if you're leaving a residue, it's a little heavy. Um, you know, anything on a leaf surface slows down photosynthesis too. So, you know, keeping that leaf mostly clean is the, the most ideal situation. Do so. you have a, a micronized calcium product that you use? Uh, there is, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, there's a soy, the soy amino company I use, they have, um, a calcium carbonate product. Down to earth? No, not down to earth. Um, no, it's an ag, a big ag company. God, I can't remember the name. Uh, Ferticel, I think does it. I think it's Ferticel. Ferticel does, uh, the amino acids and I think they do the calcium carbonate one. Um, I definitely foliar spray with some elastinite sometimes, uh, which is calcium silica. Um, the W10 stuff that is mostly available, um, that's micronized. That's that's essentially, it's not water soluble, but it, it, it goes into solution. Um, and I use that, I, I like to use that sometimes. Okay, Laura, well, we're gonna jump to the next question. Uh, wonder if different forms of sulfur would produce different forms of thiols and DOCs that's supposed to be. Um, sulfur, sulfur. Really, when it comes down to it, you know, it's the, it's just a, it's just an element. Um, how it's passed through biological systems, maybe something, but like once you apply it to a soil, it's 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 sulfur. Um, okay. I wouldn't use elemental sulfur in soils, really, um, unless you kind of really know what you're doing. Uh, they can cause issues because they are pretty. They're pretty caustic. They're they're pretty powerful. Like late Morrison says, "Don't be a moron. Less is more." Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that that he he might. I'm not. I, I'm not saying, but that's a that's a classic Graham State quote. Graham State, who's oh, okay. an economist. Yeah, he says, "Don't be a moron. <laughs> Don't put more on." <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we do have one more question. Calcium carbonate is Alka Seltzer, correct? Uh, I can't say probably, but I wouldn't use that sulfur because it probably has other things in it. That that sizzle is probably an acid-base reaction. They probably okay. put acid in there to make it sizzle. Uh, yeah, I would only use ag ag 
qual ag grade stuff um, for foliar spraying per se. Um, you know, lime, lime is lime going into the soil, but uh, yeah, there you go. So here's the website, guys. I'll also post the uh, the link in the chat if I can. Let's yeah. see. Vertisol is a great company. They have a lot of good information on their website. There, and then uh, now it's in the chat as well, guys. So there's a good company for you. Yeah. Do you have any other questions, Tim? Tim, thank you so much. For sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this has been fantastic. We're gonna, We're have, gonna to have to have you back on a regular basis because I I've got so much more to learn, and you're teaching it, man. Thank you so <laughs> so much. Uh, I I'd love to come on anytime anytime you guys would have me. I appreciate Thanks, you guys. Man. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no you problem. Bet. Thank you so much. Okay, Luna, do you have anything coming up? Tim, do you have anything coming up? Uh, events you're going to be at? Um, so I'm actually going to, um, on the 27th, on the Future Cannabis Project, I'm going to be sitting in on a panel, and we're going to be speaking to the gentleman who does uh, Living Acres Compost in Maine. Cool. And some of the best compost. He's OG of an OG. I'm really excited for that. Um, yeah, other than that, just, uh, just trying to move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Luna? Who's next uh, week? Who's next week? Uh, next week we have Benjamin Acadia. Cool. Uh, good old Ben. Good old Ben. Good old Ben. We're going to do a lot of talking about secondary metabolites. Oh, yeah. Cool. And uh, for us on the channel tomorrow night, we've got, uh, and I had it out here, uh, Pacific Northwest Roots uh, on the Dempure night on Friday nights. Um, and then Monday we have Tom Landry back talking about Layton's horizontal system. He's running it commercially. Uh, he's going to give us some updates on that. And, um, of course, the OG's Power Hour Monday morning, guys. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so okay, much. With that, stick around, guys. I'm going to end the broadcast, but uh, stick around, and we'll talk to you uh, guys uh, tomorrow night.